Chapter 8, Text and Music. So let's look for our bold, bold words, right? <clears throat> um, scat singing, right? <clears throat> this is when um, a, a term used for jazz when there's no words and they make up the uh, words like boobity beep ba da ba da ba da beep ba da. That scat singing where you are just um, making syllables up as you go, and we'll see that Louis Armstrong was and is considered the one who invented scat singing, <clears throat> the jazz trumpet player and singer, Louis Armstrong. Uh, vocalese is when the word there aren't really any words it's just like see you just using the uh, um, vowels basically vowels <clears throat> and we had these terms earlier where that the, you had sacred music and secular music and they're just contrasting all music is either sacred or it's secular it's Definitely not both. Um, secular meaning that it's non-religious and sacred meaning that it is religious. Uh, so secular music is generally in the vernacular. What does that mean? It means in the language of uh, that's spoken at that area. And uh, language has a great deal leading up to the kind of music that is uh, from that country based on the language. Uh, some say that like the German language is really um, a hard sounding language as opposed to the Romance languages like Italian, French, and um, Spanish, right? And they got parlez-vous, all these nice round sounds. Um, and, and in German, uh, we say "octum." It's a tension that has these hard sounds. But in in you know Spanish, we say "attention," which is attention. And in German, it's "octum." And you can just hear the different uh, harshness or or more uh, flowing melody type um, language. And those languages that use the vowels are easier to sing with and again so the language itself leads to what kind of music is is written that's you know works with that language and uh a lot of our music that we listen to is from the christian church because the christian church was the dominant institution in the middle ages after the roman empire dropped the ball and uh, so the so the Roman Catholic Church was it until the Renaissance and Martin Luther in the early 1500s went his own way and up to that point everything was was based on um, an attention to to sacred music because they had the money and they hired the best musicians and artists. And uh, if it was church music, it was done in Latin. In the Catholic Church, all services were required to be recited in Latin until the 1960s. When I was a child and went to Catholic Church, it was, uh, you know, et cum spiritutuo. And, you know, it's just everything was in Latin. And the, the and for a high mass, they would call it, the, the priest would say things in Latin and the church would respond in Latin. This is our um, call and response set up. And uh, so if you hear sacred music, that's, or if you hear any music, this vocal music, and it's Latin, a good guess is it's sacred. Because who would write music in Latin other than because it's for the Catholic church? And the secular music is generally going to be from the people and their vernacular. 
So composers may set an already written text to music. Uh, I remember when I was in college, I had an assignment to write uh, uh, a music using text. And he said, take the paragraph from your textbook, any paragraph, and use that and write music. And so the mass itself is like that, that the text has been used over and over again by composers as a starting point to write music. And of course, uh, a lot of theater music is um, you have a lyricist, somebody who writes the words for the play and the, and the opera and writes words for songs, but doesn't write the songs themselves. And then the composer doesn't write the words. He takes those words that the lyricist has, has written for the song and then he, he writes the music for the uh, to use those those lyrics so you have uh, a composer and a lyricist that will work together to write a song and uh we've used saw these terms earlier but the big contrast is syllabic and melismatic and then the word in between is a cross between the pneumatic but you need to know what the syllabic and melismatic is if i said I had music written and it said Alleluia. That would be syllabic because every syllable has a separate note, right? Alleluia. But if I wrote melismatic, I might have one syllable have many notes. Alleluia. So that's melismatic. Not a lot. You can have many, many notes more than that. And that was kind of more like a pneumatic setting because it had some syllabic and it had some melismatic. <clears throat> so a melisma is, uh, right? A melisma sounds like something you need to go to the doctor for. But a melisma is when you have one syllable that is used on many notes. Uh, the term word painting is is uh, very popular in the Baroque, and it's it's when you use music to try and interpret what the words say. So if you are talking about um, you know falling down the mountain, you may say falling down the mountain. The music is going down, right? Or I'm rising up to heaven. That's a melisma. Uh, not a melisma. Uh, uh, that's word painting. Sorry. Uh, one of my favorite examples of word painting is from Handel in his Messiah oratorio, which we will listen to. And the words talk about a crooked straight. And um, a straight, uh, you know, is a, is a, a geographic term where the water is narrow between two land masses, right? Like the Straits of Magellan or um, Gibraltar has straits, right? So there's a narrow body of water between two land masses. And so if that strait is crooked, again, there are two, two different words, straight meaning straight, but a strait is also a geographic term. So, and he was, uh, the German who wrote English music lived in, in England. And so the, the music says Crooked Straight. Though every time they say sing Crooked Straight, it's Crooked Straight. I just think that's so funny. Um, that's an example of word painting. A kind of review of everything we just said, right? Scat singing. Uh, and a lot of English madrigals, which is secular music. Uh, we'll see there's a lot of fa-la-la-la-la, la 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 uh, that goes on, and which is that vocalese, right? Just wordless syllable, uh, vocables. Uh, sacred music could be in any language that the, that the liturgy asks for that, for that religion.
it's uh, really odd that, like with the Latin, it was Roman language, and then it, it became uh, less important during the Middle Ages when the church was in control, and they were kind of like hiding things and have secrets. But during the Middle Ages, the Arabic countries, Muslims, made great strides in science and mathematics and in medicine. And they were translating books from the Romans that were written in Latin into Arabic. And then during the end of the Middle Ages and the start of the Renaissance, one of the things that triggered it was the Crusades where Europeans invaded the Middle East, Arab countries, and they took everything they could to learn back. And so they had books that were Arabic books and they translated them, translated them back to Latin. So there were Roman books written in Latin, translated to Arabic, and then later translated back to Latin. Does that make any sense? But that's that's progress. Uh -huh. So again, secular is non-religious, and sacred is religious. And when you translate from one language to another, uh, I think we all know that it's not easy to go from one language to another always it's not easy sometimes it is but lots of times it doesn't doesn't work it doesn't the same meaning is not conveyed so if you are writing a music and you're following the text you 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 have uh you have something to that kind of dictates what's going on right and again um we talked about the strophic form, an example of Irene, where you have stanzas that are report, that are sung with the same music over and over again. But some pieces of music have a stanza and then a set of words that are said between each stanza. So this, the, each stanza continues to tell the story, but between each stanza is a set of words that are repeated every time, which would be called the refrain or chorus. So you would have two sets of music one for each stanza and then between each between each stanza a refrain or chorus is um, lots of popular music if you like it. again the syllabic right is one note or one syllable per note melismatic many notes per syllable and pneumatic in between and the word word painting, the term word painting, right? Which uh, music pictorializes a word, emphasizes text. And in the Baroque period, often descending lines were used to um, depict death, something that was about death. Here is a pretty bizarre uh, example. It says, this humorous score of Stripsity by soprano Kathy Barbarian, a very famous um, modern 20th century singer, uh, features comic book images. This is the piece of music that, that asks the vocalist to make sounds matching the pictures. So you're a vocalist and this is all it tells you. Wow, how do you, what do you do with that? You have to be pretty creative, I think. Uh, and so here are music examples of syllabic, pneumatic, and melismatic. So here again, every word, every syllable has a note. Ah, uh, that luya, ah, uh, that luya, alleluia, alleluia. Everyone has every syllable has a note. Melismatic. So here we have O daughter and uh, two notes for this syllable, right? And how many? Eight notes for this syllable. Eight, nine, nine notes for that syllable. Read one note. Read Joyce. Look at Joyce. Four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, and more 
notes for that are sung on that syllable of Joyce. Joy. Anyway, so that is the end of chapter eight, text and music.